Okay, okay so we'll start recording. Right. <laughs> Three, two, one. Hi. Hey, welcome back to Beards and Beers. I am Todd, and we are here today with G and our special guest, Chris Benson. I'm really, really excited to have Chris on, on this chapter. And in the previous one, we were talking about the USB power supply. So I think that he might be using like this one that you show here, 60 port charging. My question is, why didn't you have power over Ethernet? Would it be simplify the architecture and make it easier for that? I mean, we tried a lot of different tests. Uh, the first problem we ran into with power over Ethernet is, um, so if you look at, at one of these, they're tightly packed in. Power over Ethernet was a, a like a daughter card, uh, a little header on here, and it took a little bit too much space, so we'd actually lose. We have 21 pi, we'd actually lose a whole pi. It required some soldering and some, some software, I think, to run, if I remember right. So it didn't work out of the box. The version two is completely different, but the version one just, just didn't work. It was also gonna reduce too much of the airflow and had a lot of power uh, uh, heat requirements or problems with it too. So we had a heat problem in general. So separ separating that out uh, into two units was, um, was really important. You mentioned uh, airflow. What kind of vents are you placing now in these new uh, micro or portable Raspberry Pi clusters, huh? The portable res, I can't really get in here. Well, let's just pop it out right now, huh? So can you see that? Yeah. Those are the five fans. Um, so these brackets hold the, hold the every other, uh, the three in between. And mm -hmm. then these larger brackets, hold the ones with the with the fans on how hard well i was going to ask how many uh what's the power requirements now that you're adding the fans and plus the raspberry pis how much this rack consumes huh this rack consumes it was 13 amps at 120 volts wow oh. less than my uh, fridge the, huh? <laughs> right the, the the big one the big one pulls 160 amps Ooh. wow so an, ex an expensive toy, yeah. Huh? Well, it's more than a toy. It's a, it's a. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, it, it it kicks ass and and it's super cool. But no, we're we're it's a student. Pro you know, there's there there was a community project at first for for the job for Java community with glue on and and some other other members, and then uh, some students have have gotten access to it. So a whole bunch of students helped me build this. And uh, we're using it for in the Oracle Labs now to test the Grawl ARM uh, unit tests. I don't know, we're running hundreds of thousands of tests a day on, on it. Awesome. So, so it Chris, is, uh, let me, very useful. Let me, let me ask you a question, Chris. Um, when, when you are writing code or um, creating whatever it is that you need to do to, like, for example, your regression tests, how are you? How are you pushing that code? How are you deploying that code to these individual pies? Do you have like a pipeline that, you know, a DevOps pipeline that you uh, have set up to push the code? Do you, do you, are you like running a, do you have a bash script? How are you, how are you getting the code? How are you developing and deploying the code to these pies? Yeah, well, we're still working on some of that. So the, the Grawl team has, because uh, there's, there's lots of continuous integration stuff. They have their own continuous integration. So we're in the process of putting that on here. What we do is we network boot each Pi. So the image is on an M NFS mount off the server. So, so there's an N a another NFS mount that has the code that we boot up. So on startup of the OS, we grab that bash script, run that bash script, and whatever that is, you know, if it's, if it's Docker that we want to run, we're network booting each, each Pi. When a Pi boots up and it doesn't have an SD card, it reaches out to the DHCP server and tries to get an IP address. So there's a little bit of uh, firmware in there. The Pi actually has some bugs in it. When it goes and asks, asks for a DHCP ad address, it doesn't do a full, uh, the full the full request. So it just requests for the IP. And so two Pis, when you boot a thousand of them up, you can actually get duplicate IPs because they don't uh, uh, check it out. Hmm. So you have to hard code the MAC address in the dhcpd.config file to an IP address. 
So there's a, I have another video and other scripts and stuff on my blog on how to, how to go get all the MAC addresses for these. So the best way that I found anyway. And um, so then the DHCP server hands off a TFTP server and then it pulls down, the pipe pulls down the image and boots that image. That image is available on an NFS mount. So we have another NFS mount that's where we have the code that we want to deploy on each pipe. So like I said, there's that, that initial boot script that goes and grabs whatever we want to run. How does that code get on that network server? Okay, so we, what we do is we first have a test Pi, and so, you know, with an SD card, and we mm -hmm. test that Pi out, get, it, get everything all dialed in the way that we want, and then we clone that SD card to that NFS mount. Interesting. Well, a little bird told me that you're planning to have augmented reality, AR, embedded in the system. Can you disclose a little bit about that? Well, what the idea is, one of the problems we run into is we have you, you have a computer display and you know a grid of all the pies but you don't know what you know which one is overheating or whatever so each one has a temperature those that's a little bit of code that's running on the pie and reporting that back to this big grid um so wouldn't it be nice to have an ipad you know and hold it over and visually see this is the ip address of this one this is the temperature you can show graphs you can show the memory usage you know all that kind of stuff so eventually I'd like to get some time to be able to do that I'm hoping this year what are you using for monitoring what kind of tools are you using grafana or something like that just to grab all the metrics and the monitoring of the system uh actually what we are using socket io so it's 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 written in in in, in uh, javascript or node so the way we were initially rendering it rendering it was just on a linux machine just in a terminal um, just refreshing the, the display, so it wasn't anything special. Sounds um, like uh, sounds like a really good opportunity to integrate with the o OCI metrics uh, API. You know, you could do custom metrics in the Oracle Cloud. Um, push up all your data to the metrics. Use the actual built-in tools, and also use the OCI plugin for Grafana, like like Guillermo said, uh, to visualize that data later on. So, um, cool. Are you volunteering? Uh, give me a. Hey, Ping me anytime, man. I'll help you out with that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the SDK yeah. is really easy. I already have a blog post that I could shoot to you about custom metrics in the Oracle Cloud. So, um, all right, we have time for one more quick question. Guillermo, you, wow. pick, the, uh, you pick the best question that you have right. and lay it on him. Well, more than a question. I'm going to take a swig of my beer. All right, cool. <laughs> yeah, more than a question is throw into Chris a couple of challenges. Because I would love to see, I'm, I'm building the OCI community out there. And I think that two projects that would be really, really awesome to see is first running the FN project, our cloud native serverless platform. So you can connect that to OCI and run metrics, billing, and a lot of stuff behind. And the second project would be running ESX, VMware, on ARM and using Oracle Linux on top of them. Do you see that feasible? Or are you looking to take that challenge? <laughs> With your help, of course. Yeah. No, I, let's, let's give it a try. I, I'm, I'm all for throwing anything on here that we can. Like, like a, you know, one of, the, one of the more interesting things was, hey, can we run SETI on it? So we did. Wow. Um, you know, so there, there's lots of things that are, that are possibilities. It's just a matter cool. of time and cool. priorities. Hey, one more really, really quick question. Where is the massive 1024 supercomputer right now? Is that, is that in London, like you said, or where is the actual one that we demoed at Code One last year? The actual one is, is in Santa Clara. Uh, it's a campus there. Guarded and under lock and key and like super top secret lab. Well, <laughs> it, given that COVID happened, yeah, it's under lock and key. <laughs> no one could get into my lab. So I, ha I, I saw it once I was able to get in and I, and I took a picture and, and tweeted it. It got quite a few views. I was kind of surprised. Nice. Um, wow. Very cool. So, hey, yeah. Chris, we uh, really, really appreciate you joining us today and in our last episode to discuss uh, all the cool things that you're working on here at Oracle. And, and we wish you the best of luck in the Oracle Labs. And uh, thanks for being a good sport and chugging your beer at 8 a.m. in uh, yeah. you know, California time. And G, I mean, it's, it's already the weekend for G. It's like, what, 5 o'clock? Uh, Friday night for G. So. Half past five, and I'm running out of beer. So, guys, see you in the next chapter, huh? Absolutely. For it's time to go grab another one. Take care. Thanks for joining Take us. Care. All right. Bye. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. 
now now I got to put this back together. It's all your fault. 